Son and Spirit, Holy Communion, three in one. Holy Father, Son and Spirit, Holy Communion, three in one. Come with your peace, with your invitation, bind us together in holy. Come with your peace, with your invitation, bind us together in holy love. Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Communion, three in one. Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, Holy Communion. virtual Sunday service. If you're logging in with us for the first time, we'd like to welcome you especially. Whether you're joining us from your couch or bed, alone or with family, we're so happy that you're here. On the website, libertyriverwards.online.church, you can find a chat room on the side of the page where you can connect with others who are worshiping together this morning. While this season can present an opportunity for rest, it can also be a time of overstimulation. Perhaps you're spending more time on your tablets, TVs, and phones, or listening to the radio. And while this happens, it seems as though each and every commercial talk show or meme addresses this unprecedented time, this uncertain time, or something that you need now more than ever. And personally, I'm rarely able to keep it on and bear the repetition of these messages. As many of you can probably relate, the monotony of this topic can feel wearisome. We are waiting, waiting for a new season when life can open back up again and ultimately for the freedom from our bondage to decay and the redemption of this world. And while waiting is actually an important part of the spiritual life, it's not all that we're called to. To paraphrase the words of Oswald Chambers, there are three parts of the spiritual life, worship, waiting, and work. Like many of us, I often tend to fixate on one of these parts at a time, especially now. However, these three aspects were always woven together in the life of Jesus Christ. As we prepare our hearts for worship, I invite you to reflect on Christ's life, his character, and his ability to empathize with our every circumstance. Hear now the call to worship from Psalm 103. I'll read the plain text and you can follow along with me by reading the bold. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are forgiving and healing God. We ask that you would forgive our doubting hearts this morning and renew our hope in your love and compassion. We pray that our praises would be a fragrant offering to you and that you would lift our spirits as we worship your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand now, if you'd like, for songs of praise.
of our service where we reflect on our sin and spiritual poverty and therefore our need of Christ, the spotless lamb, who served as the propitiation for our transgressions. Our confession scripture this morning comes from John 20 verses 24 to 29. Please follow along as I read the plain text and you can respond with me by reading the bold. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Lord Christ, how often we have heard the good news of forgiveness and restoration. We are still reluctant to believe, yet you are faithful. You give sight to the blind. You carry us when we are weary. You call us back when we have wandered. When we stay locked behind our fears and doubts, forgive us and send us out to share your grace. Take away our crippling doubts and fears 
and through the Holy Spirit, strengthen us for your service. Let us confess our doubts and fears to the one who waits to make us whole. Heavenly Father, you tell us that you will provide for us, heal our bodies, and redeem our lives from the pit. And yet we doubt you. We pray that you would restore our souls by your word and your spirit and help us to approach you in the confidence of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Take a brief moment now to silently confess your sins to the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Look up now and hear these words of encouragement from Luke chapter five. The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Please stand now if you'd like for a song of praise. Guide me all that Great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. Bread of heaven, feed me now and
Christ's work on the cross has made peace between us and our Heavenly Father, and a reflection of that gift is the peace that we have between one another. This is the portion of our service where we typically greet those around us and pass the peace of Christ. I invite you to take a moment to text someone who could benefit from the words, peace of Christ. You can also engage with the chat on our webpage or make a point of connecting with someone later today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this worship service at Liberty Church of the River Wards. My name is John Alexander, and I'm the lead pastor here. And I want to offer a special welcome if you're new to our Sunday worship services. If you're joining us through the online church platform, the top of your screen, you're going to see a link that says Connection Card. And that's just what it sounds like. If you'd like to connect with someone from our church, we'd be really happy to follow up with you. You can simply Share whatever information you feel comfortable sharing, and uh, we'd be happy to follow up to answer questions. If there's a need that you have you'd like us to follow up with you about, we'd be happy to do that. And generally, we just want to help you feel as connected here as you're, as you're ready to be. So to cast the net a little bit more broadly today, let's say you're not brand new to our community, but you've been here for a few weeks or, or months, Today, right after the service at 11.30 a.m., is the first online installment of our monthly In Covenant class. What's an In Covenant class? Well, every month when we're normally meeting together, we uh, go through one part of a three-part class. So monthly, if you go to three months in a row, you get the whole class. And they go through the core values of our church. We go over what is the church anyway, and how are we, as Liberty Church, trying to live out the mission of the church at this place in time? And how could you be a part of it? And it'll be a live uh, class conversation with, I believe seven or eight have RSVP'd so far. And if you'd like to join us, bring your questions. We'd love to have you. And at this point, if you want to RSVP, you could just email me, J-O-H-N, John, at liberty.org, and I can follow up with you towards the end of the service or, or right after the service and, and talk about getting you in, and it'll be great, and we'd love to have you. Finally, from me, by way of announcements, a reminder that during the month of April, 50%, a full half, of all of our offerings are going directly to relief for families who are experiencing needs related to the COVID crisis. So just a reminder that we're asking people to prayerfully consider how God might be moving them to be generous, to partner with us, uh, to give an uncommon response to this uncommon need that's emerging around us. So on the broader point of how we're serving our neighbors during this public health crisis, I'm going to pass things, things off now to some people in our church who even on a daily basis are serving neighbors in need as this public health crisis goes into its second month. Good morning, Liberty Church. Uh, my name is Larry Walker. I'm the Director of Neighborhood Outreach for Liberty. And if you're new here, welcome. 
Hopefully someday soon we'll see each other in person. I really miss you guys. Um, I wanted to give a quick update about the different ways that we're trying to serve and love on our community and kind of tell you where Easter Outreach is now. So I'm going to go through this quickly. This is literally my 10th take. Um, it's a Saturday and my kids are in full wrestling mode. So whatever happens, I'm going to keep this video running. And uh, hey guys, this may be like evidence in a trial someday. So who knows? Um, so Easter Outreach. Easter Outreach uh, was designed as an event that happened the Saturday primarily before Easter. Uh, it was just primarily this one day. Um, and it started about 10 years ago in our church. And it was had a couple goals. The goal uh, goals were to bring together churches in different regions to partner together and to bring unity to the church. And uh, the other goal was to address food insecurity and bless families who were struggling around the holidays. All this in celebration of the resurrection. So last year, uh, 90 churches partnered together and 10,000 meals were served the Saturday before Easter. Uh, so what's changed now that Easter is over? Uh, these are really lofty goals, I want to say. Um, and it's one of the reasons why... Uh, it's almost impossible for East, Easter Outreach to like fully reach its goal. How do you erase food insecurity and how do you bring churches together in unity with one another? Um, they're hard for a number of reasons. Churches are busy. Churches are hubs of activity. And it's not just our church. Uh, churches in other neighborhoods that we're trying to partner with or five, ten blocks away, uh, they're also super busy as well. There's also cultural differences and stuff you got to work through. And so it's never felt like we could click and really partner with any other churches in the way that uh, we envisioned. Um, also, addressing food insecurity requires a more boots-on-the-ground approach uh, that a one-day event can't really offer. Um, so after years of us as a church wrestling uh, with cross-cultural partnerships, we've done sermon series on race, we've just... We've wondered and wondered, uh, like, how do we connect to people who are different than, like, the demographic of our church? Um, I would say that it's happening now. Um, by the grace of God, this whole pandemic lockdown has brought significant changes to our schedules and has put, uh, like, a spotlight on need in a different way. And has also, like, highlighted ways that we can partner together. Um, so the Spirit has sort of filled our sails and sent us this direction, and we didn't even see it coming. So praise God for this. Um, like I said, the lockdown, it disrupted our schedule, schedules in such a way that we can really take time to partner with other churches. Um, so that said, Easter Outreach has moved from being a one-day event to an ongoing meal delivery service, okay? We have an, uh, an ongoing partnership with West Kensington Ministries and Urban Worship Center. Uh, West Kensington Ministries has a food pantry that we primarily helped help bring the food into and uh, pack it and deliver on Saturdays. Um, so last week, uh, we did around 600 meals. So 400 meals people can walk up, uh, to receive on Mondays and Thursdays. And then we do around, around 200 meals, uh, on Saturday, uh, ballpark and the number is going up. So uh, those are primarily to people who are unable to leave their home and who are most at risk. There's also packing nights on, uh, Fridays and things like that. So, uh, West Kensington Ministries is on North Square. It's at Hancock and Susquehanna. And uh, Pastor Don uh, and I have become really good friends. We've been hanging out together a lot, working together. So um, I hope that you all get to meet him soon. Um, so here are specific ways that you can be involved. Um, one, you can give to Liberty Church. So this month, half of all that we receive, we're going to give directly to COVID-19 relief. Okay. Um, so that may mean... Uh, helping those directly in our church who have a need, and it will certainly mean uh, serving those in our community with it. So um, give generously this month to the church. Um, secondly, if anyone is available during the day, um, so we have a pickup truck loaned to us by uh, one of our congregants, Justin Matulowitz, uh, and uh, guys, my life has changed so much. It's gone from sort of this regular, like we have staff meeting on this day and then we prep for like in covenant classes and, uh, you know, I go visit homes and meet with people in the community and share the gospel. Now, uh, my schedule is more like, uh, Hey Larry, we have 1100 pounds of sausage and it's in Roxborough and two other churches are trying to get to it right now. Do you want some? 
We got it for a penny a pound. This is this is a real email I got. Uh, or hey Larry, uh, there's two thousand pounds of cheese uh, sitting on a loading dock in South Philly. Do you want to go pick it up? Um, so I have the weirdest life now. I feel like I'm like running black market contraband. It's all above board. Just so you know, um, a lot of the food we're getting is from farmers who don't know what to do with this food. We have milk and eggs and stuff coming. Uh, lots of dairy. Um, a lot of it. One of the things we did yesterday was uh, the school system being officially closed for the for the school year has all the food that was in the freezers. Like you guys remember those little square pizzas um, and all sorts of weird stuff that it's like oatmeal cookies and things like that. So uh, we drove uh, me and a couple uh, teens uh, wearing masks. Uh, went to Roxboro and picked up, I think, around 800 pounds of frozen food uh, from the public school system and brought it back here. Um, so if if you have any time available during the day and you want to uh, have like the little red phone go, on, go off and you get to run out of your house like Batman and go pick up food in the city, if you have any time during the day to go help pick up food, that would be amazing. Um, there are some real benefits to this. Uh, we are typically competing with Joe Marlin to try to pick up this food. And uh, guys, we're three and one against him. So we're doing pretty good. Uh, I love you, Joe. Um, so if you want to race Joe Marlin for food to some random warehouse in Philadelphia during the day and you have the time, I could use the help. Uh, so there's that. We also need more people to help pack the food on Fridays. So all the food that we gather during the week is packed together on Fridays, prepared, uh, the, the routes are made and then it's sent out on Saturday, but we need more people to help pack it on Fridays as well. Um, another big need. We really, really, really need more freezer and fridge space. Uh, many of you sent me leads that uh, we're following up on and praise God we were able to get a freezer fridge combo this past week. Uh, thanks to one of you for free. It was amazing. Um, but we need more. So if you know anywhere we can get that, if you want to donate, whatever, um, we would take it. Uh, the other thing is mask. So uh, we we do have a difficult time making sure that everybody that we are serving and um, that everyone who is serving as well has a mask. We can handle gloves. Most of us have masks, but it's a little tricky. But the work still needs to be done. So if, I've no, I've seen some of you are making masks and um, are donating those. So if, if you're if that's you, we could take them. Um, all right. Uh, if you have an interest in serving, you can still go to fourphilly.com and see what's available there. If uh, if you don't see what any of these things that I named, just reach out to me and we'll figure it out. It's a new website, they're just building it. Like I said, we we are building this plane as we fly it. And so things happen with that. And so let's be gracious, let's be patient with people. And um, hey, I'm sorry for the long announcement, but you could just fast forward through the part uh, later where John Alexander cries. And that'll be like, they'll take up about eight minutes. And so, um, hey, I'm just kidding. Love you, John. I miss seeing you cry in person. Um, I love you guys a lot. And the Lord is with us, and the Lord will carry us through this. And uh, all right, see you guys. Bye. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 27. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. 
And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. If you spend any time in the river wards of Philadelphia, these are the neighborhoods that our church mainly serves. People come from other neighborhoods as well, but for the most part, we serve Fishtown, Kensington, Port Richmond, Old Richmond, Bridesburg, Northern Liberties. If you spend any time in those neighborhoods, certainly if you live in those neighborhoods, you know that c construction is everywhere, at least for the last few years. Some parts of those neighborhoods, it seems like there are multiple projects on every block. Something happens when you're around lots of construction, even if you're not a contractor, or if you're like me and you're not even very handy, you start to know as you watch a new construction before, during, and after, you start to know which new buildings have it where it counts and which ones don't. Because when they're completed, all new construction looks great, but they are not all. For example, I can walk past most new fences or decks, for example, and tell you what they're going to look like in 18 months. I know what it looks like uh, when a new fence is put up, but it's going to be totally warped in 18 months. This isn't all new construction. It's a lot of it, though. A lot of you have moved into new construction, and that first month, you say, oh no, it looked so amazing. This all reminds me of a very famous statement of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's recorded, where Jesus says, whatever is hidden will be revealed. It's true with real estate. Jesus is talking about people, of course, though. Whatever is hidden will be revealed, sure as the sun rising. Whatever is hidden in a person will be revealed. And Jesus isn't just talking there about secrets, like information that you're trying to keep hidden from other people or from the world. He's talking about who you are. What a person is about will be revealed. Whatever is hidden will be revealed. It's true. And as we end the sermon on the Mount, this seminal teaching of Jesus, um, some of the most famous phrases of Christ in the New Testament, he ends with three illustrations that each teach something different, but there's a theme that holds them all together, and it's this. Whatever is hidden will be revealed. Count on it. Whatever is in a person will be made plain and like so much else in the Sermon on the Mount, you're not supposed to just think about someone else. In fact, it, well, it's true that anyone out there, what's hidden in them will be made plain to God and the world. But actually, the weight in these illustrations that end the Sermon on the Mount is placed on you yourself. It's placed on me. What is in me that is hidden even to me will be made known to me and to the world. It's like Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by asking you a question. Do you want to know who you really are? Do you want to know what you're really about? You're gonna find out. Without fail, you will find out. 
I can show you now, if you'll let me, or you could find out at a more inconvenient time, or you could even find out when it's too late. Do you want to know what you're really about? This is how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to give you two points that go with this theme. Whatever is hidden will be revealed. And they come right out of this text. First point, first way that what is hidden can be revealed now for you. First, don't trust the outward appearance of people or of yourself. Don't trust the outward appearance. And secondly, the fruit of people's lives tell the real story. Don't trust the outward appearance. The fruit of a life tells the story. First, don't trust the outward appearance. Look again at verse 15, which was read a moment ago. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So this is aimed primarily here at religious leaders, right? Those who come as clergy or evangelists or ministry leaders or pastors who seem to be one of the flock, right? One of the worshiping community. But actually they have very dangerous ulterior motives. And this isn't the first time, right, in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has gone after religious leaders. The very first chapter Chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 is where Jesus says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The, the scribes and Pharisees are those who had the five books of Moses memorized. And they're also who Jesus is referring to in chapter 6 when he talks about those who give alms to the poor and pray on street corners and make a public show of their fasting so that people will see what's going on externally. But the point is, they're basically really beautifully decorated tombs that look great on the outside, but inside there are only dead bones. Don't look at the external appearance primarily if you want to know what someone's about, and if you want to know what you're about. Now, there's an ambassador from the United Kingdom to, uh, from Britain to the U.S. during World War II and a little bit after. His name was Oliver Franks. And he would send confidential information by airmail most of the time, because a lot of his communication, right, he's a ambassador during wartime. He would send most communication by airmail, but if he had a piece of information that was of the utmost importance, you know what he would do? He would put it in a regular envelope, like any other piece of mail, and just send it through the normal post. Why? Because people aren't going to notice just a normal envelope. Surely, surely a truly valuable message wouldn't come by way of, of a totally forgettable, forgettable envelope. But actually, this is how it goes with stewards of the gospel message. This is how it goes with ambassadors of Jesus all the time. And Jesus can't say it enough. The mark of an ambassador for Christ is not the external appearance flashy and exciting church programs, or gifted rhetoric. I mean, just look at Moses. He had a terrible speech impediment, and he was the leader of Israel. It seems like Jesus can't say this often enough, again and again, and not just Jesus. This is in Paul. This is throughout the apostles. Why are we so hung up on things that are dazzling as the exterior goes? Later on in this very passage, verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says more. He says, Some of you will even be those who prophesy in my name and heal people. Like, do useful things. Cast out demons in my name. Some of you, I will say, I never knew you. So these two are external things. 
giftedness doesn't even seem to be mainly the point, right? What is the mark of an ambassador for Christ? What is it? The message and actions of the sender of the message are clear through the messenger. Whose message is it? Jesus's. Whose kingdom is it? Jesus, the king. So if the ambassador of the king presents the clear message of the king with attending actions that are reflective of the king, that's how you know that it's a true ambassador. What's hidden will be revealed. And again, the idea here is that the person themselves is surprised when they say, Lord, Lord, they find out that what was going on in their heart all along was not a pure motive. The point seems to be some wolves don't even know that they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Secondly, first, don't focus on external appearance. Second, the fruit will tell the story. The question here is, in verses 16 to 20, Jesus gives this illustration, the second illustration of uh, a good tree producing good fruit and a bad tree producing bad fruit. A good tree cannot consistently produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot consistently produce good fruit. The question is, what are our lives consistently producing? Note, the question is not whether or not you're producing something, whether or not you're bearing fruit. Healthy things grow, but so do unhealthy things. The question is what? And I think you can look at this uh, to apply it to us, both in a, uh, in a way that it applies to our culture at large, and also we can apply it individually. So first, maybe it's a little easier to, to first apply it to our culture at large. Ask two questions of our culture. And I think it'll get at the fruit. The first is, if you went up to the to a random person on the street and said, what are the most significant achievements of our culture? You might say, they might get back some answers like, well, we can do heart transplants. We can do face transplants now. We've sent people to the moon. These are big achievements, right? We can split the atom. But then ask another question. What would you say are the marks of a truly healthy culture, of a mature culture? What, what are the very most important things that a culture should want to get right? Well, you might get somewhat different answers, right? You might get things like, well, it is important to love one another. It is really important to respect one another. It's really important for a healthy culture to care for the least among us, financially least, culturally least, uh, in terms of age, those who are overlooked, under-resourced. Is that true of our culture? You might get different answers. Are we a healthy tree culturally? And of course, you can ask the same question of churches and you can ask the same question of individuals. What is the greatest achievement of your life versus what is the sign that there is health in you? How could you tell? It all comes down to this question. As far as Jesus is concerned, what is good fruit? Jesus is really clear about this. It's in verse 21 to 23 again. In verse 23, he says, I will declare to some, I never knew you. Depart from me. Good fruit is knowing Jesus. And it's also in verse 21. Doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. Good fruit, culturally in a church, in an individual, is knowing Jesus and doing the will of the Father who is in heaven. This is the test of a healthy tree of the true sheep. Is there any desire in you, in us, for communion, for encounter with the living God? 
And is there any evidence that we have actually been walking with him? Because, of course, to walk with him is to become like him. When I look at my life, does it really seem like the kind of thing that is produced, born of one who has encountered and is encountering Jesus Christ? What's hidden will be revealed. Is it there? Is there any evidence for it? Let's just say for a moment that the answer is no. Okay? Let's say that the answer is no. There is not evidence in my life that I am walking with the king in the way of the kingdom, exercising poverty of spirit and mourning uh, the, the tragedies of this world that I tend to turn away from and mourning my sin that contributes to them. There's no evidence of meekness or a hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's a hunger and thirst for a thousand other things, but not really of righteousness. There's not mercy, only condemnation in my heart. There's not purity of my heart. My heart is going after a multitude of things, not the one. I'm not a peacemaker. And I do not, I do not find myself ever willing to bear any kind of discomfort for righteousness sake or for the sake of the one who is righteousness. Uh, I flee any discomfort in my life. There's no fruit of the kingdom in my life. What can I say? You know, can, can, a, can a bad tree just become healthy? Can a, can a tree uproot itself? Can a, can a wolf become a sheep? You know, this, this is one way that, you know, there's an old adage that if you take any illustration far enough, it breaks down. And there's, there's ways to take any one of these illustrations to a point that Jesus doesn't intend. Because i got to tell you, wolves become sheep. They do. The answer is yes. You can change. And that's what I want to bring to bear. To that I want to bring to bear the final illustration here in verses 24 through 27. I'll just read it again in its entirety. Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. What I want you to see here is the invitation that begins this third and final illustration of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, there's an invitation here. Many decide to change their foundation. And so can you. Do you know the story of the Apostle Paul? Before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul the Pharisee who was persecuting the church out of a zeal uh, for God. Out of a zeal for God, he was murdering disciples of Jesus. And he had this experience that we read about in Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus Road, where his deeds are revealed to him in a way that are blinding. And God shows up and reveals himself to him. And he spends three days in silence and in the dark. And when he wakes up, he's a new man. He's beheld Jesus in his gospel. And he spends the rest of his life about another mission, bearing different fruit, having had an encounter with the Holy One whose disciples he was murdering who had grace on him, mercy on him, as he has for countless others. And in response to that love and mercy, lives a different life on a different foundation. Another story that hit me during Lent this year, um, before we had to start practicing social distancing, we were doing these evening services and uh, for each service, there was a different member of our congregation who would lead us through a little bit of a testimony based on uh, the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. And Carol Davis shared part of her story um, based on one of the last sayings of Jesus on the cross. It was, it's where 
um, there are two other thieves that are being crucified on either side of Jesus. And one of them is condemning Jesus with the rest of the crowd. And the other one is saying, hey, I belong here on a cross because of my actions. But I see that you are the innocent one. And you are being crucified for my sins and for the sins of the world. And he says to Jesus, remember me when you enter into my kingdom. And Jesus says back to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And Carol told us that she had the opportunity to, to share these words with her dying father as he came to understand that he really was the thief on the cross. He deserved nothing but wrath. And he stood to receive nothing but grace. And the thief in those last moments, in those last moments where the only fruit that he could bear were the fruit of his lips, testi testifying to the goodness of Christ before a mocking, condemning crowd. And he was welcomed into the kingdom. This illustration, like the others, is a picture of a hidden thing that will be revealed, a foundation. You can't see the foundation of the house, but sure is the sun rising. It'll be revealed. And again, like the others, it'll be revealed in a way that previously was, was hidden even to the builder. It's not revealed just to the world. It's revealed to the builder what he built on. It's not like the builder in the illustration is spending and investing all this work and time and energy building a house so that it will fall? No. The revelation comes, and you can decide what to do. By the words, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them, Jesus is inviting anyone who hears to move to a different foundation now. And so I just want to end by asking, what about you? You know, it could be the crisis of 2020 that is the season you look back on and say, you know, I was standing on a different foundation and I realized that my foundation was certainly going to lead to destruction, both eternally and in temporally, you know, in if not this year, then in 10, in 50, in 80 years. This is not a sure foundation for my life. And I came to stand instead on a different foundation. We call him the Rock of Ages. That's how he's known. And we stand by the forgiveness that his blood purchased for us of every one of our sins, forgiveness. And we stand in confidence of his truth, that his way is worth following. That could be your story in the midst of this season. And let, let me just tell you one thing that everyone now knows that is no longer hidden to anyone. Storms come. Storms come and they uproot your life and they crush economies. Everyone knows this now. If they didn't know it, in early March. And the scriptures, I gotta tell you, give you no assurance that the storms will stop. Let me tell you, if anyone tells you in the name of Jesus that the storms of this life are going to stop, you can be sure that they are a liar. The scriptures give no assurance that the storms will stop in this life. The scriptures give assurance that in and through Jesus, you can stand through the storms in this life. And here's the beautiful thing. Here's the beautiful thing. If you stand in Jesus, you do way more than stand. You bear fruit. The Apostle Paul gets into this at the end of the letter to the Galatians. You bear fruit in your life if you stand in Christ in his forgiveness, in his grace, and you walk with him on his way. You bear fruit like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faith and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And that is light 
that the world needs right now. Isn't it? That, that's what Jesus says that you are. You are the light of the world. Through him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to lead us now in this prayer of longing for communion that I introduced last week as we wait expectantly and long for the time when we will be able to receive communion again when we're physically together in the same place. You're invited to read this prayer along with me. Lord Jesus Christ, grant that just as the hem of your garment touched in faith healed the woman who could not touch your body, so may your servants be healed by faith in you, even though we cannot now sacramentally receive you. We pray this on the basis of your tender mercy, Lord Jesus, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. As promised, over this past week, I posted a YouTube video on our YouTube channel for any who are interested in uh, our church's understanding of communion and why we won't be trying to find some way to partake virtually uh, or in some other way until we're able to gather again in this same place. Feel free also to send me an email if any of you would like to engage on that question personally. I'd love to talk with you more about it if you have questions. Finally, if you're someone who this morning feels some urgency to respond to Christ, after all we've been studying in the Sermon on the Mount these last few months, or even if you're just joining us for the first time, I want to invite you to do two things. One, there is this request prayer function. You won't see it on YouTube if you're joining us on YouTube, but if you're using the church online platform that most of you are using, I'll invite you to just click on that request prayer and someone from our church would love to engage you on where you are and what it would mean to take the next step of faith in Christ if this is something that's new to you. And the final thing I'll invite you to is right after the service today at 1130, we're going to have a live conversation, a live class that we call an in-covenant class for those who are both exploring Christianity and looking to get more connected to this local church. And we'd love to have you join us. You could just email at this point, john at liberty.org, J-O-H-N at liberty.org, and I could uh, interact with you about that class, and you'd be welcome to, to join us late this morning. And um, with that, let's sing this song as we respond to God's word together and long for communion together at last. I am the one The earth is my handmade work The skies I laid them white beauty for Horizon to horizon Creation to creation sings you. Welcome all, gather round, all ye refugees, come in. Welcome all. Thank you. 
go out and join Join the great procession The mountains and the hands of religions Horizon to horizon Creation to creation with one voice Welcome all, gather round All ye refugees, come in Welcome all, gather round All ye refugees, come in Welcome all We will now bring our petitions to God by praying corporately for our church, city, and our world. I'll conclude each prayer with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to respond with me by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Father, we pray for our church that you would empower us to see the needs of the body and respond accordingly. We thank you that your Holy Spirit dwells in all of us, despite our distance. And we ask that you would draw us into the life of Christ as we seek to live, speak, and serve as his presence during this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the city of Philadelphia and those who have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. We pray for those who are in vulnerable and under-resourced communities, those who have lost their jobs and don't have safety nets, children without safe spaces to go to during the day, and people who are trapped in domestic abuse. We cling to the fact that you say you give good things to those who ask, and we ask that you would protect your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, that you would protect and guide healthcare workers and first responders. We pray that you would give wisdom to elected officials and public health experts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This is the point in our worship service where the Liberty Worshiping Community continues our worship by generously sharing some of what God has entrusted to each of us to steward financially. It's just a reminder that during the entire month of April, 50% of all offerings that come in, 50 cents on every dollar, will go directly to families in need due to the COVID crisis. This is providing food to families who are experiencing food insecurity. This is also helping people to pay bills that they are unable to, to pay, considering all that's going on around us. So thank you for partnering with us to meet needs in community, and we'll sing a final song of worship to conclude our service together. There's no deed that can redeem us, there's no right no magic word. It is finished, he has done it, let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished, please just shout with ragged words. And go bring me into battle, knowing he has won the war. It is finished, let your hand and we can
There's no sacrifice you offer. There's no man Freely drink our living water with our money coming It is finished, she has done it. Let your weary heart rejoice. Our redemption is accomplished. Please a shot with ragged boys. And go bravely into battle, knowing we as one more. It is finished, let your hand let every sinner rejoice. Be the dying victor's cry. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. This is a final benediction that I pronounce upon you in Jesus' name from the end of the letter of 2 Corinthians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. God bless you.